what would it be like to meet your husband's killer? Hey, thanks for joining us for number 23 in this series of Gateway to Joy programs and comments from friends, family, and others who have been affected by the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot. She called us to live to a higher standard every day, not satisfied with just a little religion in our lives when we could have God's best. Be challenged by what you hear in the coming days as we continue our extended series about Jim Elliott's Operation Alka and other events during Elizabeth's time in Ecuador. We have two Gateway to Joy programs originally aired in March of 1989. The first is called Irreducible Minimum and the second Meeting My Husband's Killer. We're also joined by Kathy Reeg and John Hansen. John has written the theme music for our time together. And Kathy Reeg is the president of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation. She'll be talking about living with the Alcas, as John will as well. And we'll hear the voice of Jim Elliott from a sermon about the resurrection. All coming up today. First, though, an irreducible minimum. As we continue to learn about Elizabeth making contact with Alka women, and she figured at one point that she had learned enough of the language that these ladies were inviting her to come back with them to where the Alcas lived. What was the name that the Alcas gave to Elizabeth? You are loved with an everlasting love. And that's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend Elizabeth Elliot talking with you this time about the irreducible minimum. I've been telling you the story of my making contact with two Stone Age women by the name of Mintaka and Mancamo, members of the tribe who had killed five missionaries in 1956. They lived with me for a while in a Quechua house quite a long way from their own territory. And during that almost one year, I was trying to learn their language And toward the end of the year, I had learned just barely enough to understand that they were inviting me to go back with them when they went home again, which was exactly what I had been hoping might happen. God was going to open a door to enable me to go in to live with this Stone Age tribe where no outsider had ever lived before and come back to tell the tale. I had made some tape recordings of their speech and sent them to Rachel Saint and Dayuma. Rachel had been studying the Alka language with Dayuma, a member of the tribe who had left her people long before. And so they had sent back some transcriptions of these tapes. And as we talked about my going back with them, this was what they were saying to me. On the way down to our houses, we'll sleep at the Anyangu River. Next day, we'll be on the trail still. On the third day, we'll arrive. Men, brothers, fathers, people like our own relatives will come to visit us here, I'll say to my people, said Mankamo. Don't fear them. Build Gikari's house. Gikari was the name they had given to me. We'll bring her here, make also a guest house in an airstrip. When she is here, her friends will come to sleep sometimes, collect pets and animals from the jungle. These you will give them in exchange for their gifts. My people will say yes. When they come in the airplane, you'll see them. They'll take you for flights. I had rides in the plane. They will teach you God's words. You must listen and teach the children. Listen well. Hear them sing. It's good. That which they shall teach. We'll build our houses on the Lawano River on a nice open place. You and I will have houses side by side. I'll tell them to make a huge strip, cut down all the trees. Last night I dreamed I took some Quechua women down there and told my relatives to cut them some wood. If I don't go home soon, I won't be able to find my family. They will move far away. They will wait till now, for this is the season of Kapok. If I don't arrive before it passes, they'll leave. They may be living in small houses separated throughout the forest. We would not be able to find their footprints. We ought to go while they are still together in one place. Then they will listen and say yes. I will say to my brother Dabu, Remember how you cried when they killed the five foreigners? They were good men. You wished they had lived. The wife of one of them still lives. She is good. She will come here to live. You must spear fish for us. From now on, we will live happily. Things will be different. We won't cry anymore. 
I saw some chonda blossoms. This means that it's time to go home. A year is nearly up. My children will not do well if I don't go to see them. They will think I'm dead and do what they please. I'll make them all work, every one of them together, to build the house and airstrip. Believing in God, we'll live well. Lots of people we knew were believers, I'll tell them. You, too, must become a believing group. All of that is a transcription of the tape that Mankamo had made explaining how we could go back and live with her people. Well, when I was beginning to plan what I was going to take with me, believing that I would have to carry everything on my back over a three-day trail trip, you can imagine that I spent a good deal of time thinking of what was really necessary. Don't we have some strange ideas about what we need, about the irreducible minimum? Think of the contrasts in our civilization as compared with that of a jungle Indian. Wouldn't life be simpler without the enormously confusing conglomerations of options that we have? When I send my husband to the grocery store, I can't just say oatmeal on the list. If I do that, he is confronted with instant oatmeal, quick oatmeal, old-fashioned oatmeal, maple-flavored, cinnamon, Quaker, Irish, stone ground, natural, milled, etc., etc., not to mention different sizes. There's a whole aisle of cereal, and he stands there bewildered looking at his grocery list. Time is consumed in these decisions. Time is consumed in searching for them. I think back to that woman spoken of in the New Testament who was cumbered with much serving. I imagine her life was extremely simple by comparison with ours, If Martha was cumbered, what about the modern housewife? Jesus said to Martha, Only one thing is necessary. Necessary, referring to the matters of life and death. Necessary, referring to things which matter for eternity. And Mary, Martha's sister, had chosen that good part, which was to sit at Jesus' feet. Jesus wasn't saying that it wasn't necessary to cook and fix supper. After all, Martha was doing this for Jesus. But the problem was that she was cumbered. She was worried. She was in a frantic frenzy trying to fix a company meal. Well, I had to sit down and sort and sift through all the things which I had considered necessary, even in the relatively simple life that Mankamo and Mintaka and I were living with the Quechua Indians. It was quite simple there, but to carry things on my own back meant that I would have to reduce it even more. And as I went through this process, I remembered the words of an old missionary to China, Hudson Taylor. It was his principle in life to go through everything he owned every year. If he found things which he had not used for a year, he would get rid of them because he decided, if I have gotten through this past year without needing this, I can get through the next year. Well, my husband Lars and I have some disagreements about things like this. I am a thrower awayer. I am constantly reducing and organizing and simplifying my life, and he is continually wanting to hang on to things. And one of the things that we have a running discussion about is an enormous set of crimpers. You farm wives will know what crimpers are, but I'm not so sure the rest of you will. These crimpers are a big, heavy tool which are for castrating hogs. And Lars went to veterinary school, and so he needed them back then, but each time I want to clean out the garage and get rid of those crimpers, I say to him, now, darling, do you really believe you're going to have a need for these in the coming year? His answer is... I want them. Don't throw them away. Well, this is the world we live in, and Christians need to seek God's help in deciding what to keep and what to give away, because somebody else might need it worse than I do. Why shouldn't I give it to them? We need to have a place for everything and everything in its place. I was going through some old jungle accounts the other day, trying to decide whether to get rid of those papers that bring back all sorts of nostalgic memories, and I came upon one year's 
total expenses, which came to the thundering sum of $600. That's what it cost me to live for a year in the jungle. We are stewards charged with the administration of our affairs, with what has been given to us. We are going to have to give an account to God. Well, as I was trying to sort through what was the irreducible minimum in my life, this is the list that I made for myself. Bible, notebooks, pen, ink, matches, pot for cooking, medicines, one change of clothing, shoes, soap, salt, snake bite kit, toothbrush, comb, needles and thread, knives, insect repellent, calendar, blanket, container for Valerie's milk, powdered milk, plate, cup, spoon, camera, film. It seems like a long list when I read it out loud like that, but it's precious little compared to what we consider necessities in our modern life. When we got there to Alca territory, we found that even these few things complicated life. The Alcas would look at them and say, what's this for? And what's this? And what's it made of? And where did you get it? And what are you going to do with it? Why do you have two of these, two spoons, for example, two blouses? Why don't you give me one? It was impossible for me to explain that I needed them. Why do you want it? And I would ask you that question. Is there something that you feel you just simply can't live without? Why do you want it? Is it a necessity or is it a matter of pride, greed, insecurity? Lars and I were talking with a man yesterday who says that his wife tells him she has got to have a mink coat. What kind of a mink coat, I said. Full length, he said. Lars said, how many times in a year is she going to wear that? And he said, well, maybe four, maybe five. What is it that makes a woman say she has to have such a thing as a full-length mink coat? I think of the words of Paul in prison. He said, I have not been in actual need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances may be. I know now how to live when things are difficult, and I know how to live when things are prosperous. In general, and in particular, I have learned the secret of eating well or going hungry, of facing either plenty or poverty. I am ready for anything through the strength of the one who lives within me. Nevertheless, I am very grateful for the way in which you were willing to share my troubles. He's writing to the Philippians who had helped him financially and in providing for his needs. He said, now I have everything I want. In fact, I am rich. Imagine a man in prison saying that. My God will supply all that you need from his glorious resources in Christ Jesus. Can you trust him for that? Gateway to Joy 123 from March of 1989, Irreducible Minimum. Later, the Gateway to Joy program called Meeting My Husband's Killer. But first we hear from that husband, Jim Elliott, a message on the resurrection. The Lord Jesus then teaches us that the great lesson of the prophet Jonas, which we have generally understood to be the lesson of a, a disobedient prophet getting next to his God, is actually the lesson of the resurrection. The Lord Jesus saw in the uh, story of Jonah the sign that he himself was to be to that generation in which he lived. When Jonah came up to Nineveh, although we don't read this in the book of Jonah, we assume it from what Christ said himself, he was a sign to the people of Nineveh. And what kind of a sign was he? He was the kind of a resurrected sign that Christ was. That is, Jonah came into Nineveh and he began preaching, Yet forty days in this city God will destroy. And the people of Nineveh repented. And they began to ask questions, Who is this man? And I suppose they told Jonah with questions. And it came, became known that this man was a man who just come from the seashore where he'd been spewed up after three days and three nights in the belly of a great city. And as he was the sign of resurrection, and he came to those people, and they repented, so he, he teaches us the lesson of Christ. It's interesting that Jonah was unlike Christ in that when the people repented, he was sorry. The people of his generation were unlike the people of Christ's generation in that they did not repent when Christ rose from the dead, whereas in Nineveh, the men of Nineveh repented when Jonah, in a figure, was lifted from the dead. 
so that Jonah found himself in a happy circumstance and turned sour on it, and the Lord Jesus found himself in a very difficult circumstance, since the people didn't believe in his resurrection, and was sweet about it. But that's the lesson of the prophet Jonah, as interpreted by Jesus the Christ. He teaches us that the lesson of the prophet is a lesson of three days of death and then resurrection. The voice of Jim Elliot himself, Resurrection, Jesus, and Jonah. Have you ever wondered what it was like to live with the Alcas? Kathy Rigg, the president of the Elizabeth Elliot Foundation, has a quick comment. How in the world could this woman have gone back into the jungle and lived with the people who had actually taken the life of her husband? and all these other missionaries. I mean, that's kind of a, just leaves you kind of incredulous. You're just like, really? Kathy Reek, president of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation. Later on, we'll hear from John Hansen, musician who has uh, written the theme music for our time together. He'll have some thoughts about living with the Alcas as well. But first, what was it like to meet your husband's killer? Did Elizabeth have any doubt if so, what made her go through with it? What happens if we dig up and doubt what we planted in faith? And what was the primary feeling when they came to the Alka village on Jim's birthday? Would you be surprised to hear that the Alka people were generous and unafraid? On October 6th, 1958, I left a little jungle station called Arahuno, with 10 Alka Indians who had come out from their territory to Arahuno to meet us, five Quechua Indian carriers, Rachel Saint, whose brother had been killed along with my husband a year and a half or two years earlier, my daughter Valerie, who was three years old. This was our party as we left Arahuno. When we got to the first stopping place, about six hours down the trail, we met there a woman named Maruja, who had been kidnapped by Alcas a year or so before. I talked with Maruja about what we were about to find when we got to the Alca settlement. She was not very happy with those people, you can understand, since they had kidnapped her, but she had spent a year with them and really gotten quite friendly with them. They had not harmed her in any way, but she said to me, in my opinion, you will all be eaten by vultures within a month or so. Then she told us about the story of a Canadian explorer who had gone into that territory while she was living with the Alcas. His name was Trembley, and he was from Canada. Trembley had apparently committed suicide, and they said the Alcas didn't bother to bury the body. They left it out for the vultures, they pulled out his teeth and gave them to the children to play with. You can imagine this was not a particularly bright prospect, and as I sat in that Quechua house that night with my diary, I made a few notes about my doubts and fears. Was it right to come? Was it right to bring Valerie? But I am of the firm conviction that it's not really a good idea to go back on a decision unless God has given overwhelming evidence that one should change one's mind. As Dr. Edmund, the president of Wheaton College, used to say when I was a student there, never dig up in doubt what you planted in faith. And so the next morning we piled into the canoes and journeyed down the Kurarai River and up the Anyangu, a little tributary of the Kurarai, which took us closer to Alka territory. It was a beautiful day. The water was beautiful and clear. The Indians fished occasionally as we went along. We saw an alligator and a few turtles. It was very slow poling along in the canoes, and it was slow walking on the trail. Finally, we broke out from the trail into a little jungle clearing. This was that strong city which I referred to a few days ago. From Psalm 60, Who will bring us into the strong city? Wilt not thou, O God? We were very close now to what had seemed a strong city, indeed an impregnable fastness. 
The Aukas who were with us were simply coming home. The Quechuas were approaching those who had been hated enemies as long as they could remember. All six of them had their guns on their shoulders, although Dayuma had assured them that there wouldn't be any danger to any who were her friends. Valerie was asleep on the back of the Quechua Indian Fermin. She knew no fear. She was going to Mintaka's house as she had prayed. But for Rachel and me, you can imagine it was a moment of high excitement. But the greatest feeling was one of gratitude. We came around the last curve of the Tiwano River. There stood three naked Indians in front of a small cluster of thatched huts, the strong city. The date was October 8th. It would have been Jim's birthday if he had not died. It would have been our fifth wedding anniversary. There's no faith where there is no consciousness of risk. Remember that when Peter had to get out of the boat and walk on the water to Jesus, surely he had doubts and the consciousness of risk that he might sink. But the thing which was dominant was his faith in the character of that man Jesus, whom he knew so well. His faith embraced the consciousness of risk. And sometimes people have said to me, when you went in there to those Alcas and took that little girl of yours along, weren't you afraid? Didn't you think there was any danger? Well, the answer is, of course I knew that there was the possibility of danger. I knew very well that they might do to me what they had done to my husband and the other men. But what I also knew was that God had opened a door, that God was directing. At least I felt sure that this was the next thing that God wanted me to do, and so my faith had to embrace the consciousness of risk and the doubts. The character of God is the ground of my faith, not the outcome which I am hoping and praying for. Does he guarantee results? No, he wants us to trust him. And I want to read to you from C.S. Lewis's children's book called Prince Caspian. Some of you that have read it may remember the story where Lucy has seen the great lion Aslan, but she cannot convince her brothers and sister that she has actually seen him. And so Aslan is telling her that she must go back and tell them again that she has seen him. If you go back to the others now, Aslan says, and wake them up and tell them that you have seen me again and that you must all get up at once and follow me, what will happen? There is only one way of finding out. Do you mean that is what you want me to do, gasped Lucy? Yes, little one, said Aslan. Will the others see you too, asked Lucy? Certainly not at first, said Aslan. Later on, it depends. But they won't believe me, said Lucy. It doesn't matter, said Aslan. Oh, dear, and oh, dear, said Lucy, and I was so pleased at finding you again, and I thought you'd let me stay, and I thought you'd come roaring in and frighten all the enemies away like the last time, and now everything is going to be horrid. It is hard for you, little one, said Aslan, but things never happen the same way twice. It has been hard for us all in Narnia before now. And then they go on talking about it, and then Aslan says, Now, child, I will wait here. Go and wake the others and tell them to follow. If they will not, then you at least must follow me alone. It's a terrible thing to have to wake four people all older than yourself and all very tired for the purpose of telling them something they probably won't believe and making them do something they certainly won't like. I mustn't think about it. I must just do it, thought Lucy. She went to Peter first and shook him. Peter, she whispered, wake up, quick. Aslan is here. He says we've got to follow him at once. Well, I won't read the rest of the chapter, but I want to remind you of that one sentence of Lucy's. I mustn't think about it. I must just do it. Because that really fits what I had to do when we went in to live with the Alcas. There were a lot of things that could have deterred me. The results were not guaranteed, but God was trustworthy. And so when I did this, I want to assure you that I don't think I was being more obedient than at any other moment, nor was I more in God's hands than at any other moment in my life. He was not more in control. 
But we felt it, we believed it, and we consciously trusted him for the results. In other words, the danger of the circumstances made my obedience that much more significant, that much more necessary. The possible risks made us that much more conscious that we were really in God's hands. Think about that the next time you have to do something which is very distasteful. Don't think about all the possible results. As Lucy said, just do it. So we walk into this clearing, and there stands Kimmel, one of the men who had killed the five missionaries, standing there in a very nonchalant way, wearing his string. That was the Alka man's complete costume, just a string, standing on a balsa log, declaiming, gesticulating. He had thick balsa plugs in his earlobes, and there were two naked girls standing there next to him, all of them very self-possessed, very calm, as they faced this string of outsiders that was coming in. Rachel, my daughter and I, and the Quechua men who were carrying our things. I wrote in my book, The Savage, My Kinsman, a description of that first scene. Two pretty girls, also naked except for the string around their hips, stood smiling beside their tiny leaf shelters. Their hair was cut in bangs from the tops of the ears straight across the forehead, hanging to the shoulders in the back. I was immediately impressed with the dignity and simplicity which characterized them. Faced with six Quechua men who were dressed in foreign clothing and carrying heavy shotguns and loads, the Alcas stood quietly and gazed steadily. Valerie sat down, fixed her eyes on the first Alka man she had ever seen. I had told her plainly that her father had died, that he was living now in Jesus' house, but I had said very little to her about how it had happened. I wanted to save it until she could comprehend it more fully. Somehow, however, her mind had associated Alka's with her father. She studied Kimo's face. Finally, she spoke. He looks like a daddy. Is that my daddy? So we lived there with those people, 56 people, seven men. They'd never seen strangers before. They'd never seen giants before. I was a giant to them, much taller than the tallest man, head and shoulders taller than the tallest woman. They were generous, friendly, humorous, curious, and unafraid. Valerie and I lived in a house with no walls, no floors, and no furniture. I slept in a hammock. She slept on a piece of split bamboo laid over three logs, spread out her little doll blanket, a little scrap of cloth, and was at home. Meeting My Husband's Killer, Gateway to Joy 124. Well, we're, we're almost at the end of our time together, but before we go, let's hear from musician John Hansen, the one who has written our theme music. He has some thoughts on Elizabeth going to live with the Alcas. I can't remember the time that I specifically heard of of what happened to uh, Jim and the other missionaries uh, when they were killed, but I do remember hearing about it as a kid and being just kind of astounded that not not just that they were killed and that that happened, but that Elizabeth and 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 the others actually went to those tribes after you know their husbands had been killed and and that part really spoke volumes to me because we can read about sacrificial love in scripture but but when you hear stories like that it really it really is motivating and it really is brings it home in in a new way musician john hansen the one who has written the music that you're hearing right now And with that music, it's a signal that our time together is just about at an end. But first, let me thank you for letting us come into your home, your office, wherever we found you today, maybe out on a jog. Uh, Thanks for uh, spending some time with us. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, Charlotte, North Carolina, let me invite you to check out all the resources available at elizabethelliott.org. Until next time, may God remind you daily you're loved with an everlasting love. Underneath or what? Yes, the everlasting arms. Mm-hmm.